Well, good morning. It's wonderful to see you this morning at Emmanuel Baptist. If you take your Bibles, turn to 1 John. I think I could sing those three songs every Sunday like the rest of my life. Maybe my three favorite. I don't know. I have a lot of favorites, but uh, glad we could join our voices in singing those together. They really uh, introduced the message well this morning as we look at 1 John chapter 2. Let me just kind of remind you where we were last week and tie this together. Last week we ended with the thought that Christians ought to live like Jesus and to walk like Jesus walked, verse 6 of chapter 2, and to live like Jesus is to walk in the light. That's chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. So in the context of those verses, walking in the light is loving the brethren. So verse 9, notice again, it says, whoever says he's in the light, that's someone who's saying, I'm a Christian. Because we know from chapter 1, to be in the light is to have fellowship with God. And so if I'm claiming to be in the light, I'm claiming to have fellowship with God. So that's a claim that I'm a Christian. So whoever says he's in the light, but hates his brother, guess what? He's still in the darkness. Verse 10, whoever loves his brother abides in the light. And in him, there's no cause for stumbling. Then verse 11, whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I don't think John could say it any more clearer than he just said it. To walk in the light is to walk as Jesus walked, is to be a Christian, And that walking in the light, I know there's many things of what it means to walk in the light, but fundamentally, it at least means to love the brethren. It means more than that, but at least means love the brethren. So it's one of those things where it's more, but it's not less than loving the brethren. Now, with that in mind then, we come to today's text. This morning, we're just going to look at verses 12 through 14. And we're going to take uh, the next part of that, uh, 15, 16, and 17, next week. But in my mind, as I'm reading the scriptures, we're going passage to passage, I'm always asking, how does this connect? Because he's just now saying to us that as Christians, we are to walk in the light, and walking in the light means that we love one another. There's, there's expressions, and it's obvious that this is a, a loving body. And so then he goes to this poem, and what we look at this morning is it's a poem. And this poem then, he talks about generations. He talks about children, he talks about fathers, he talks about young men. What's the connect there? And then he goes to the next section where he then talks about a love that God hates, which is love not the world. So I think it would be this. Having just said, walking in the light, walking like Jesus, is to love the brethren, there is an expression of that love that takes place within the church, because the church is a generational spiritual family. And so an expression of this love, walking in the light, is the church. And then he goes on to say a a negative expression of this love is a love for the world. So I think that's the connect as to how we see these passages working together. Now, if you would uh, find your place in 1 John chapter 2, if you are able, why don't you stand with me as we read God's word, you follow along. I'll read 1 John chapter 2, and I'll begin there in verse 12. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Amen. Anyone thankful for that today? Amen. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you've overcome the evil one. I'm writing to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. May God bless the reading and hearing of his holy word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We want this part of your word, like all of your word, to abide in our hearts. We need this, Lord, and I I pray right now on behalf of our whole congregation that we will see the beauty of these words, 
that, Lord, we will see the connection of them to our lives. And that, Father, as a result of this, we would love one another in a greater, deeper way. And that, Father, that love would be, would be so evident that it would be like light that would shine in darkness. It might even be light that attracts others that they might know the Lord Jesus Christ, that they might know the joy of having their sins forgiven, of knowing you, and of overcoming. And we pray these things, Father, in Jesus' precious name, amen. All right, you may be seated. Be thinking about how this applies to you right now today. So as soon as we walk away from this text today, how does this apply to you? How are you, you know, there's so many multiple ways in which this would apply to you. And so I want you to be thinking about that. Now, let's talk about loving the church. I want to take these verses, these three verses, and from these three verses give you two reasons why you and I should love the church. And the first reason is this, because God in his design has made the church to live as a family. He's made the church to live, to function as a family. Now, you'll notice the structure of these verses, 12 through 14, are different. Unless you have an authorized version, typically King James Version does not uh, show when there is a poem or a confession of faith or so forth. But most other modern versions are going to, just in the text itself, you're going to see that it's just, it's just different, right, than the rest of the text because it's showing that this is a poem. Now, it's possible that this was actually a song that was being sung in the church so that when John writes this, as a church receives this, they recognize the song. That's possible. Or it's possible that he's comprising it in this letter for the first time. But either way, this is clearly a poem or a song that, uh, that John is, uh, is, is writing here and is, is uh, containing the, the, the message of the church that he wants us to have today. Uh, sometimes, you know, things are written in poetry to be more expressive. Uh, sometimes there's, there's more of a beauty or flair in poetry than there is in just common prose. Certainly for the sake of memorization, poems can be easier to memorize things than not. A lot of times in poems there's repetition, and you'll notice that here. There's several of the phrases that are repeated. And so maybe just for expression, for uh, to say things in more of an unusual way, or for the sake of being more singable, or for the sake of being easily memorized, John gives the church here this poem about the family of God. So again, whether it's a song in circulation, whether John now is creating it, really the point is still the same. We have here this beautiful and memorable expression of Christian reality set in the context of the family of believers, the church. Now you may have already asked this question because obviously the poem does not use the word church, so you may be asking, why are you saying that this is the church? And I would say it describes the church because he's clearly describing a generational and spiritual family. He describes a generational and spiritual family. Now let me say this kind of as an aside, but sisters, this morning I don't want you to be offended because he refers to fathers, he refers to young men, doesn't refer to mothers, doesn't refer to daughters or sisters. Uh, so you might be questioning that, you might wonder why that is. And there are certainly uh, beautiful things about a family. This is God's design. Beautiful things that we experience in a family because of God's design of men and women and the difference of men and women, fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, the whole thing. John's point, though, isn't to, to point at that beauty to make a point. His point is to point at something else that's beautiful about a family, and that's the generational relationships within a family. Grandpa, grandma, the children. I mean, in, in typical times, typical holidays, we, we know what this is all about. Probably most of you have some celebration in which there's a generational celebration that's happening. The, the generations get together, and you might have two, three, four generations that are there and celebrating the holiday. And you know what it's like. Isn't it wonderful to have grandpa telling stories? 
You know, Grandpa tells stories about the good old days, doesn't he? He's probably describing what, it, what his first flip phone was like. And that's, that's such a wonderful, beautiful thing, isn't it? And then, of course, the children. The children, it's just so, it's so wonderful to have children around. The, just that, that excitement of children. You know, you can't hardly think about Christmas time without thinking about children and their excitement. The, the night before Christmas, they're going to bed. They can't hardly sleep. They can't wait till the next day. And there's just a, a wonderful beauty about that, isn't there? So when we think about the family... It's not only just male and female, but there's generations in that family. And I think John's point in this poem is to point to the beauty of those generations to describe something about the church. The dynamic of a generational family is what John captures. Okay, you got that point? The beauty of the dynamic of a generational family. Now, the church then has children. And with this, I'm not just talking about children's church. We're talking about a spiritual family here. So we're not talking about ages. A spiritual family has children. I think that would represent new converts. Again, with children, there's a a beauty and joy about children. You love the simplicity and honesty that a child reflects. It's it's kind of refreshing. I know it can be annoying when you go to the store and there's there's a little kid throwing a temper tantrum. And... um, there's a sense though let's look at the bright side he's being honest <laughs> don't you love that i mean it's, it's kind of refreshing he hasn't become jaded like the rest of us or we <laughs> we to our own uh detriment hide everything he's just being honest with kids that's how it is it's just out there with their feelings and their thoughts again the excitement of children at christmas time it's a beautiful thing get your your little one a a present they unwrap it and they play with the box and not the toy children are great aren't they well think about the church the church needs and is blessed by children new converts it's so refreshing to be with new converts it's so refreshing to be around someone who has just come to faith in jesus christ just the excitement of their faith. Every Sunday for them is like Thanksgiving dinner. I mean, I, I know how it is. I mean, I've, I've grown up going to church. And unless I'm sick or something like that, I'm, I, I've been in church just about all of my life. I still love it, by the way. But, but I do know the temptation that when you've come to church week after week after week after week, to, to kind of be a little bit dull with it. And uh, sometimes the music helps us, you know, shake out of that. Sometimes maybe the sermon kind of helps us shake out of that. But I know what it is. I know what it is to kind of feel that gravitational pull to dullness. Man, new converts, it's like there's no gravitational pull. Every Sunday's Thanksgiving. Pastor opens the word and preaches a message, and they're like, that is utterly amazing. The music it's so exciting. You know, we were singing today about having your sins forgiven. Are you kidding me? Standing before the God of heaven someday and your sins not being brought up, not having to give an account for your sins, there's that excitement and joy and beauty of new converts. A church needs new converts. That's why we pray for evangelism at our church. That's why we encourage evangelism. We want you to be sharing the faith. We, we try to give you ways like, like the chosen and inviting people to watch the chosen and things that we can do to try to help you get the word to people, to try to help you get the gospel to people. Our church needs new converts. Your small group needs new converts in it. It's just a wonderful thing. Again, I know what it's like to be with people who have been Christians for a long time and we get together and we start talking about things new convert is like, what in the world are you talking about? And why are you talking about it? And sometimes we just kind of need to be slapped in the face and say, you know what? A lot of the things we get all wound up about, maybe they really aren't that essential. Maybe they really aren't that important. Boy, new converts are such a blessing to the church. What does John say about them? They, they're such a blessing. Their sins are forgiven. That's what a new convert's thinking about when they come to church my sins are forgiven and I know God 
You know the Father. Well, that's a wonderful thing. God bless Emmanuel with new converts. Amen? Amen, let's pray for that. Well, the church is also blessed because there's fathers. I think fathers would represent those who have grown spiritually, not to perfection, obviously, but those who have grown spiritually. Fathers in the faith are those men and women who have weathered a lot of storms in life and yet still walk with Jesus. Boy, there's a beauty in that. They've seen things come and go, and yet there's a stability about them that is so encouraging and hopeful. Remember, especially as a young pastor, I used to look at, at uh, older pastors, maybe a retired pastor. I'd look at a, at a pastor who'd been a pastor for many, many decades, and it was always so encouraging to me to think that God's grace is sufficient for the long haul. And churches need fathers. Every church needs fathers. Experienced, faithful, long-suffering saints Saints who, I have a book by Eugene Peterson, and I'm not meaning this to be snide. The high point of the book is the title. But the title is, it's a great title. It's, it's entitled, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. Not to say the book's not bad, you, you'll get something out of it. But the title's the best part of that book. A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. That's a father. That's a brother or sister who has walked with the Lord for a long obedience in the same direction. What does John say about these fathers? You have known him who is from the beginning. See the time factor there? It's reflected because in the children you know God, but here with the fathers you've known God from the beginning, the one who was from the beginning. John's just, just dropping this in there to help us see the time factor. Fathers, obviously, are those that are older who have, who have matured. Church also needs the young, needs young men, those who are changing and growing. They're somewhere in between the new convert and the matured saint. Young adults are strong, they're hopeful, they're optimistic. They have dreams, they're ambitious. They have a get-her-done attitude. Young adults, think about it. In our society, young adults are the ones who are doing the heavy lifting right now in society. They are the ones who are raising children. That's heavy lifting in a society. They are the ones who comprise the majority of the workforce. They're the working middle class. You know, if you need something moved, you don't Google geriatrics. You want a young man. You want someone that's strong, energetic, fit. And listen, every church needs the spiritual young who are doing the work, they're paying the bills, they're serving the church. Every church needs the spiritual young. What does John say about them? You are strong. Now that is, that is characteristic of the young, isn't it? They're strong. You are strong and have overcome the evil one. So I want us just to take some time to reflect on this. I think this is why John puts this as a poem. It's, it's unusual than the rest of the text. It's something that stands out to us. Might have been a song that they already sang. It might have become a song that they sang. But, but here it is. We have this, this poem to help us reflect on the beauty of a generational spiritual body, which is the church. Now, we also need to love our church, not only because of God's design and making it like a family, but this family is also a great place to grow. And with that, I want to go back and focus on what John says in this poem about the young, about the young men. Notice verse uh, 14 again, the second part of it, where he's going to say three things those who are growing, they're somewhere between the new convert and the matured, seasoned saint. They're growing, they're changing, they're growing, and John says this about them, I write you, young men, because you are strong, the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. I would see that middle part is what holds it all together. The reason you're strong, 
The reason that you overcome is because of the abiding word that is in you. That's true in salvation. There's a sense in which when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he is the living word that comes to abide in you. But also when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, God removes your heart of stone and he gives you a heart of flesh that's alive unto his word so that when his word falls in your heart, it falls in a place where it can grow, where it can live, where it can abide. That's the abiding word. So think about it. You're strong, the word abides in you, you've overcome the evil one. The key there is the word abiding in you because when the word abides in you, that's where your strength comes from. When the word abides you, abides in you, that's how you overcome the evil one. Since we're talking about overcoming the evil one, let's talk about this. There's two, uh, we'll just say weapons that our adversary, the devil, Satan, uses against us. He plays a two-string fiddle. There's two strings. He, he has a lot of tunes that he plays on those two strings. But he play, basically plays two strings. One is the string of accusation. And the other then would be the, the string of temptation. Satan works to destroy your faith by accusation and by temptation. Let's talk about that accusation just for a bit. Here's why this is a challenge, because his accusations about you, about me, to God, are at the same time true. I mean, let's face it, he has a lot to work with. Can we be honest in church this morning and say, let's face it, yeah, our accuser has a lot to work with. That's true, but it's not everything that's true. It's not the whole truth, because while it's true that he has a lot to work with, it's also true that we have an advocate, the righteous. We have an advocate who, as we learned in chapter 2 and verses 1 and 2 in particular 2, that has become this advocate, the righteous Christ, is the one who has become our propitiation. Meaning that when he stood in our place and suffered in our place and died in our place, He not only in that atoned for our sins, but he removed the wrath of God forever. He appeased the wrath of God so that God forever will look at you as his child in the righteousness of your advocate, Jesus Christ, always and forever. So here's what's going on. We have an accuser. How How, God, could you love him? How could you love her after what they have done? God, you search the hearts of everyone. You know the thought that was just in their mind right now. You know that inappropriate affection that they just expressed in their heart. You know all things, God. You know everything about them, every detail, every word they speak, every action. You know it all. That's true. But you have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous, who in the shedding of his blood atoned for your sins and removed the wrath of God forever so that God says, and remember the blood of Christ continues to cleanse us from all sins so that God God says over and over again, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. My son, my daughter, always and forever. Sometimes you feel those accusations more than others, don't you? Sometimes as God's child, you feel the accusations that he brings against you. In that moment, there's there's an abiding word in your heart, and you need to actively use that abiding word that says, I have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the one who makes my case. He is the one who represents me to God. He is the one who not only atoned for my sins, but removed the wrath of God from me. I'm his son. I'm his daughter. So that's how you fight the accusation. Then there's the temptation. Satan basically tempts us in a couple ways. He he lies to us in that in trials, God isn't good. 
That's how we're tempted to think, isn't it? When life is difficult, when life is, is hard, when things in life don't go in a way that is readily seen as good or helpful, we, we're tempted to think God's not good. That's why this is happening. God's not good. He doesn't care. Or we are, we are tempted in temptation to say that sin is better than God. That's, usually, that's what's going on in all of Satan's temptation. He's a liar, and he's wanting you to think God is not good, or he's wanting you to think that sin is better, and then to act on that. We overcome his lies as Jesus did with the abiding word. Let me just refer to Luke 4 or Matthew 4. You may be familiar with the temptation of Jesus. He's in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights, He's fasted for those 40 days and 40 nights, and Satan appears to him and tempts him. Remember the three temptations? One is turn the stones into bread. After 40 days, that might sound like a a good deal. Turn the stones into bread. Remember the other one was to see the nations of the world. I'll give you all these nations if you'll but worship me. Or from the top of the temple, throw yourself down, let your angels catch you, and glory in your position as the one the angels care for. These three temptations, Jesus meets all of them. You remember, don't you? What are the words that he meets them with? It is written. Just stop and think about Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Savior, our righteous one, the one that we follow. The word of God was abiding in him so that when he was tempted, he drew on that abiding word to resist the temptation. Listen, you will resist temptation when the word is abiding in you. Now let's just stop and think about that. There's already a lot out on the table. Let's try to think about, remember when we started this message, I said, I want you to think about how this applies to you right now. So how does this apply to you right now? There's so much to think about. Number one, you individually, let me just encourage you with those three R's. I say this from time to time, but let me encourage you with the three R's. Rebuke, renew, and replace. Okay, so when you're tempted, you're you're going to draw on that abiding word. You're going to remember these three R's. You first of all rebuke it. You you rebuke that temptation with the abiding word of God. You renew your mind. You think on what is, as Philippians 4, 8 says, what's true, what's noble, what's just, what's pure, what's lovely, what's excellent, what's worthy of praise. You rebuke the thought, you renew your thought, and then you replace it with the opposite good. You use scripture to do that. So there's a lot you can just think about in your own life. The only means in which you are strong and that you overcome is as you draw on the word that is abiding in you. The abiding word. I want you to think about this just in the context of the church. I want you to think, if you've professed faith in Christ, if you've walked with Christ for a while, I want you to think about this. In this family dynamic of spiritual generations within the church, could a new convert look at your life and say, by God's grace, there's a brother or sister who is strong. There's a brother or sister who's overcoming. There's a brother or sister who's weathered a lot and is faithful to the Lord. You know, could could this new convert come to you and, and get counsel from you about their own spiritual walk, about the things they struggle with? Would you be able to give counsel to them? We need to think about that because we need to be strong. We need to be overcoming. We need to be maturing and growing in the Lord and helping, helping others. So I want you to think about that. I want you to think about giving thanks and praying for your church. This, this church and no church is a perfect church. We realize that. And yet we have an advocate. And we appeal to that advocate. We want to honor that advocate. We want to bring glory to that advocate week after week as we meet together. And while this is an imperfect church, you and I must and should be thanking God 
for the dynamic of a generational spiritual body that, that we're a part of. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I want you to be thinking about how this applies to you. Uh, I'm going to come back after a bit and close the service and talk about some things specifically for us as a church. But uh, before we get there, let's pray, let's sing, let's worship the Lord, and then uh, we'll come back and talk about those things. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you so much for your word and for this poem, this beautiful expression of a generational spiritual body, the church. Father, we confess and recognize that not just individually, but collectively as a church that we still are imperfect, still, still far from being conformed perfectly to the image of Christ. And yet, Lord, we know that what you're concerned about is not perfection, but progress. And so, God, by your grace, may we be progressing in love, in truth, in strength, and in overcoming for your name's sake. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.